I'm Shelley Bathlen, director of The Garden, a center for grieving children and teens. It gives me great pleasure to have a conversation today with Dr. Jonathan Schwab of Northampton Area Pediatrics. Dr. Schwab has been a champion of the garden since our very beginning, even before I was a part of the program. Uh, the garden opened in 1998. At that time, we were a program of the Hampshire Regional YMCA in Northampton. And um, about five years ago, we became a program of Cooley Dickinson, VNA and Hospice, where we are today. And today I am so excited to be talking to Dr. Schwab again and to see his face and to hear from him. So Dr. Schwab, tell us a little bit about who you are um, and your program in the community. Thank you very much, Shelley. I appreciate that introduction. So I'm a pediatrician at Northampton Area Pediatrics. I'm the medical director of our office. And um, I've been involved with the garden, as you said, since its beginning, really, at the end of the 1990s. Um, and um, as initially, I was the uh, part of the advisory board and then uh, continued on in that role and have still been a strong supporter of this very important program uh, because it really does uh, give our patients a wonderful opportunity to go through the grief process that they need to go through and it supports them. And, and we have no other place to do that in our area for kids. So I recognize that as, as something, a need that our community had, and I was very uh, happy to have the opportunity to be involved in its creation as well as support it along the way. It's been a win-win. Uh, you've just, you know, a champion and um, have really, I feel like you and I have done several projects together over the years in helping the community learn about the impact of grief and um, that really that children do grieve, even though they're young, they might not have the words, they might not have the cognitive capacity, but in fact, they do grieve. And um, I know that we see grief in different ways. You know, as a pediatrician, you see it more physiologically and we might see it more um, emotionally. And so I'm wondering if you could talk about um, your experience of, of how you've seen grief manifest itself. Um, and maybe if you have any examples of, you know, the different ages of, um, of that, that would be really interesting. Sure. I, I, first, I, I would say that the garden and being involved with the garden has, has educated me and, and helped me understand grief much better than I did before. I didn't realize what grief was. And I would start by saying that, you know, in medical establishment, we think of things as being, uh, as being either normal or abnormal. And, and that's how we're trained to, to do and think of things. So when somebody comes to me with a, a problem, I think about that. And then I say, well, that's abnormal and we we're going to treat that. Or that's normal and you don't have to worry about it. Just forget about it, right? But I've learned through the garden that grief is not in that, doesn't fit that modality at all. It's really a path or a place to go along the way and you don't think of it as abnormal or, or, or normal. You think of it as something that needs to be supported and go through and walk along and you need help during that. And that's something that the garden provides, which I never had any concept about. I was always stuck in that normal, abnormal position. So kids, what do they do? When they experience a grief, um, they of course experience many of the same feelings that, that you or I might of sadness, remorse, and missing of the person. Um, and, and that I think we all can relate to having lost something that's important to us. But unlike adults, children don't have maybe the cognitive abilities to process these sort of feelings in the same way. So as a result, uh, they can't express it, they can't talk about it, but they may, they may demonstrate it. They may get angry, they may get irritable, they can't tell you what's going on in, with them. So they're more, maybe more likely to show it rather than talk about it. Um, they will show and demonstrate feelings of anxiety, be fearful of new things in their lives, going to school, going to friends' houses. Uh, 
that they might be fearful that they're, 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 if it was a parent, that their other parent is going to, to go away. They don't completely understand the process of death, depending upon the ages that they are. Um, they may have trouble sleeping and lose their appetite. Um, so these are some, many ways that, that children might present to me in my office when they're going through grief. Um, often children often have uh, somatic complaints, we call that, of, of, that is, it, it, it hits them somewhere in their body. They'll start to have headaches more. They'll start to have stomach aches. They may have trouble breathing. They have more asthmatic attacks. So we have to think about that in terms of, of how they're processing the grief or the loss. Uh, and, and it's very important to be able to help them along the way. Uh, and we don't think of this in, in the garden, you don't think of it necessarily as a therapeutic thing to go and get this treated, as I said, or, or removed. We have to help them along the way to experience these things to move forward and, and in this process. Absolutely. Um... A lot of times when I'm working with families, they do talk about, I feel like the number one disturbance that I hear over and over from kids of all ages and even adults are the nighttime disturbances, right? Mm -hmm. Harder to get to sleep, harder to stay asleep. And so I'm just wondering about a family that may come to you. Is that something that they would bring up with you or is it more, I mean, that is kind of somatic, but um, I'm just curious how, um, you know, sleep issues might be addressed or, or come in or present, I guess, with you in your office. Um, yes, it's common for, for uh, children to have sleep issues and it might be a manifestation of grief. And the way I might approach that is twofold. Um, and I still, as I talked about the medical model before, I still try to help with the sleep issue by itself. And there are many different things we can do to help children with sleep issues as we would if they were caused by grief or caused by something else. Uh, that is kind of trying to make sure the routine is okay of sleep and how you lead up to going to bed. And even medications can help with sleep. But the key here is that if the sleep issues are really related to the grief or the loss, we really have to get at that and understand that and help them along with that. Otherwise, giving a medication is just kind of like, like putting, it's just not help. It's not really getting down to the underlying problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Another question that I ask in the intake is, or the way I frame it with the family is, so grief is a natural response to any change. And so, uh, and then I ask, have you noticed any changes in diet or sleep? And um, when we get to the diet part, I ask, are they eating, do you find that they're eating more or eating less compared to before the death? And, um, and then if there is this big change, then um, I will then talk about the grief part, but then I always say, you know, I wanna make sure that your pediatrician is aware of this so that they can monitor any weight change and, and that kind of thing. Um, so that's a little bit of a, you know, a two-way street, right? I want to make sure that um, I'm not diagnosing, but that I want to make sure that they, they're getting that support. I'm wondering, Dr. Schwab, if there's a case that you could um, speak to of, um, you know, someone who came into your office and, um, you know, with some exploration, you found out that they had experienced the death of someone close and they were in fact grieving and could then make that connection to what you were seeing maybe somatically or hearing some uh, somatic symptoms and and then inviting them to look at their grief and, and maybe a referral. Sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I can think of a, a teenager, for example, several years ago who, who came in at this point, I knew that she, that she had lost her mother, who was her major caregiver, and uh, and she came to me saying that she just it wasn't interested in doing anything anymore. She wasn't interested in going to school. She was having again trouble sleeping and loss of appetite, and really just was kind of going through the 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 everyday lifetime things without any joy. And she was thinking, of course, about her mother all the time and was wondering what could be done to help. Well, at first you think, okay, well, she's depressed. Um, 
and 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 in many ways she was depressed but also these were things that are considered typical for a certain period of time uh if it continues after the loss of her mother there are ways of treating depression that i would standardly treat other people who have depression for other reasons but it also may be just completely normal and not need to be treated as depression for a certain period of time if they go through this grief process and this loss. So I suggested at that time, rather than a medication, I said, well, maybe you could talk to somebody, but also I did refer them to the garden. The garden was a group that I knew of that had uh, other people who were going through the same kind of process. And, um, and so she, she seemed amenable to that. And, and she did start to see the teen group at the garden. And it was really almost life-changing for her because she was able to really connect with other teens and other people who were going through the same kind of process and that same journey that she was. And she was, it helped her understand the normality of that, number one. It helped her just do fun things and things and get her mind off of what, of the, the great loss that she had. And through that work, and of course, through it, she did see a, a therapist too, to help her with her own depression that was related to this. You know, she started to, to enjoy things. She was going back to school and doing better. And she ended up actually, as I think you know, getting involved with the garden and, and helping out other teens. And, and, and this is the kind of thing that a, a support group like the garden can do for, for many children. Great example, great example. And, and um, I, she was a, quite, a, quite a participant for us. So it was, it was really neat. Um, and I, I know there's um, been a case, I think it was Dr. Kenny, is that right? He's, he's one of my partners. Okay. Yes, yes. I think a few years ago, he and I consulted about another case where I was helping him come up with some language mm. to help, um, you know, give to the families, um, uh, one particular family. I don't know, I don't recall if that family came to the garden, but neither here nor there. Um, I just, you know, I love the, um, you know, the partnership that that we have where um you know i will help where i can and um and certainly you know we welcome families who who you all refer so it's it's uh, it is a great partnership yeah along those lines i i still have the um the resource list that you have given me over the years of how of books that parents can use to help explain uh, the loss and death of somebody to their child. And it goes from different ages, depending upon the age of the child and their cognitive abilities. Uh, it's a very difficult question for, that parents come to me with, you know, if they, if a, if a grandparent or a parent or a sibling or anybody or a dog or any animal, you know, something, buddy who's close to that child who has now died depending upon the age of the child, you explain it to them in different ways. And you've given me books and lists of books of how to explain it and help kids along the way in understanding what death is. Yeah, just the other day, I had uh, two patients whose father had died uh, very quickly, unexpectedly. And I talked to the mother about how to, what to look for and how to help their children, her child, her children um, uh, go through this grief process. And, you know, before the garden, I, I would talk to them about this, but I was kind of left always in a, in a quandary of, well, how else can I help them? Mm -hmm. um, but this time, and since the garden, I've been able to say, here are, here's a number, here's a person who can give you some ideas on how to help your child through this process whether you go to the garden and participate in the program or not is, is not the important thing, but at least this is some, a resource for you. And, and it's very, it's very helpful for me to be able to actually say that to a parent rather than saying, I'm not sure what I can do to else to help you or where to send you other than to maybe an individual therapist, which is not what many parents, children need. Mm -hmm. If a child is, uh, is going through an atypical type of grief process, maybe that would be more appropriate. But, but for every child who's lost somebody of importance, 
having some support and help to guide them along the way that the garden does is very valuable. And for me to be able to say, here's a number, here's a place, they know what they're doing. That's really valuable for me. Yeah, and that's that's really the referral process. And then it puts, you know, kind of the responsibility on the family to give us a call. Um, there have been plenty of times when you and I or your colleagues and I will con consult about a particular family, but ultimately it, it is up to the family to take that next step to make the call to us. Um, we don't need anything more formal than that. And, um, and so that is the, the, the referral process to the garden. Mm -hmm. There have been a few times where there's been a tragedy in a school, for example, mm -hmm. um, and the schools are looking for support on how to help the other school students uh, with that grief, their grief and loss. And, and what can the school do to, to help with that process? And, and I know that you and I've sat on a, on a, on a, at a meeting, for example, of a community meeting when a, when a teen had, had taken their own lives and that was so tragic and unexpected. And, and how does it, the whole school and community deal with that? And I know that you've been wonderful in, in volunteering your time to help communities go through such tragedies. The mission of the garden is to support young children and their families after someone close in their life has died. So young children is defined as between five and 18. So the school age child. And um, they come to us after the death of someone close. More often than not, it's a parent, a sibling, or a close grandparent. We have an on-site program for the whole family. We work not only with the children, but we work with their adult caregiver at the same time, because we know that um, when someone in a family has died, it's not just the child who's grieving, it's the whole family. So we have support groups that kids can participate in with activities, projects, and games. And then at the same time, we work with their adult caregivers um, where they have the opportunity to um, share about the challenges of raising a grieving child or children while also grieving themselves. And that adult group is oftentimes just this wonderful exchange of what's worked, what hasn't worked, community resources, who's kid is in therapy, that kind of thing. Um, in addition to our on-site program, which was the kind of the foundation of the garden that we started with in 1998, we have developed a school outreach program where we are available to school communities up and down Pioneer Valley. And um, after the death of someone close, whether it be a student, whether it be a staff member, or someone close to the life of a student. We are available to support them kind of in a crisis situation. Um, as Dr. Schwab was just uh, referring to, a school district experienced the death of a student by suicide. And we were able to come in and consult with the staff. We consulted with the close uh, circle of friends around that student. And then um, Northampton Area Pediatrics and the Garden and some other community resources were part of a community panel where um, members from the whole town could come and hear us talk about how to support these grieving children. And it was a wonderful evening of um, you know, question and answer where these community members really wanted to know how to support their kids. And some of the students were, you know, weren't closely connected to the student, but they heard about it. And so it was still impacting them. Um, I can also come in and do um, support groups, whether or not there's been a tragedy, it doesn't um, matter. Um, each school, it looks a little bit different, but for the most part, it's um, a group of at least five students that comes, becomes a part of a group that meets weekly for eight weeks. And I can do that at the elementary, middle school, and high school level. And I have even worked with, um, have led groups for uh, students at the area colleges. And, um, and then we've done, um, you know, just different speaking engagements to help uh, the community learn about grieving kids, um, to help the community learn about how to support, um, you know, those in their care, whether it's, um, you know, children or adults, you know, caring for children. And um, I think, you know, my, um, my kind of my personal um, agenda in all of this is to kind of 
change the tide in our death denial culture. Um, all living things die. John and I at some point will both die, uh, for example. And um, we just don't know the when, we don't know the how, we don't know the where. And um, it's my hope that in doing this work with the kids and families through the garden, that those families and the families that they're in contact with will feel more comfortable in supporting kids and more comfortable in just talking about death. And, um, and therefore learning how to support those who have experienced a closed death. And so all of these different ways, whether it's you know, talking to students in a group or talking to a family over the phone or consulting um, with Dr. Schwab at Northampton Area Pediatrics or um, you know, a program on site, all of that is in my mind planting seeds and uh, brings us back to the name of our program, which is the garden. And um, so, I just wanted to give you a, a huge thank you again, Dr. Schwab. It's always a pleasure to work with you and to hear from you and to get your support in this very important work. And I'm so glad to be able to partner with you, uh, at, you know, from the garden. So thank you. Well, the pleasure is mine. Thank you for your, all the work that you're doing for our community. Appreciate it.